Hello, friends. So good to be with you today. We've got something very exciting we're beginning is the book of Revelation. Uh, we've been going through the entire New Testament, just verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And uh, if you would like maybe some more study material, you can go to my website at jerryedmond.com. And I've got all of the, well, the entire New Testament that is there. But we finally have come to the book of Revelation. And, uh, you know, when it comes to this book, it's a little bit different than a lot of the others, because I know that there's as many opinions about this book as there are people. I mean, everybody's got one. And sometimes it's a little bit frightening how quick people can slam the door on any opinion that's really different from their own. Maybe you know some people that's like that. The, but the book of Revelation is an interesting book. It's, uh, it's, it's very, and can I say it like this, abstract. It's very multidimensional. Uh, very multi-dimensional in its writing. And what, what I mean by that is there's a whole bunch more to it. There's a lot more layers to it than we think there are, than we really can get to. So I, I want to just encourage you as I begin this study, don't get locked in a box and somehow suggest that there's only one layer of interpretation. Uh, and and it's, that's easy to do. We, we do that with a lot of things, but don't do that here. Don't do that here. Keep an open heart. Keep an open mind with what's going on. And don't be foolish enough to think that yours is the only truth because you're going to find that God's got some more things than even you realize is actually there. Now, rather, what you need to do, and this is something that I want to always try to do, I want to become a student of the Word. I want to position myself to learn. Maybe I'll see something that I haven't seen before. So stay open to things that might be different. Sometimes different is good when you're in search for something. And uh, stay open to the things that might be different. And, and, uh, and, and I'm not saying lose sight of, of what the message is. I mean, hold, hold tight the vision of John and what John was seeing. Uh, but but uh, be open about where we're going. And so what I'm going to try to do in this teaching, I'm going to try to cover as much as I can. Uh, I will tell you right up front, I cannot answer all of it. There's no way possible that I can answer it all. All I can do is kind of help build a framework for you, hopefully, that you'll be able to, uh, how can I say, uh, um, add to and build on your understanding of Jesus Christ. Because that really is the answer right there. If I could give you the key to this, and we're going to read it in just a moment uh, as we begin the study, but you got to remember that this is a revelation of Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's a revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, where do I come to the stopping place that I've learned all about him that there is? I'm just going to tell you something. I think we're going to spend eternity searching out the beauty and the wonder of the revelation of Jesus Christ. I mean, we may never, ever, and throughout eternity, we may never exhaust that search. I'm telling you, he is the Lord. He is, Jesus is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He's the everlasting King. And I'm just telling you right now, there is no beauty. There is no wonder that can match him. There, there's nothing greater. There's nothing more wonderful. There's nothing more magnificent than the beauty of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's what the book of Revelation is. It is a revelation of Jesus Christ, okay? So let, we got to lay that groundwork. Let's talk about John for just a second, okay? Before we get into the book, John was one of the apostles of Jesus, of course, uh, John was in the inner circle with Jesus. He was consist he, he, which consisted of, of Peter, James, and John. And um, what a what an amazing man that he was. He he wrote the book of John. John's dad was Zebedee, which was a fisherman in uh, in Galilee. Uh, thanks to the uh, wonderful series that came out, the Chosen, they gave a little bit of personality to Zebedee and. <laughs> We started calling him just Zeb, yeah. <laughs> but in, in that great, but um, what, that that was his dad was Zebedee. He was he was a fisherman there in, in Galilee, there at the Sea of Galilee. Uh, he and his brother James they were very close to Jesus. I mean, there truly was an inner circle uh, in in Jesus' life and ministry, and John was one of those. Uh, John laid his head on the chest of Jesus at the Last Supper. It's it very intimate and close time. Uh, John was the first one at the tomb. John was the first one to believe. Uh, and, and now John 
is, is well, he's in his 90s. He's probably 95, 96 years old. And now he's come to this place where, where he's writing this book and he has this incredible vision of uh, seeing uh, uh, Jesus. And this is while he's in isolation on the Isle of Patmos. Now, Patmos is just a little six by 10 mile island. It's about 35 miles off the coast of Turkey. Uh, so he is on this island. He's He's been put there for punishment. I guess they tried to kill him a couple of times, couldn't do it. So they just exiled him to that to that rocky little whatever it was. And and so he has this vision, and it's incredible. And I, I want to, to, just before I start reading, I do want to lay just a little bit more groundwork. And please forgive me. I normally won't talk so much about we'll get right into the teaching, but I feel like I need to lay a little bit of groundwork for what we're about to get into. This book opens and closes as a circular letter, basically, that was sent to seven churches in the ancient Roman providence of Asia. And uh, the first feature of that was is that it predicted the future. Verse 3 even talks about that. It said the words of this prophecy. What he's given here, what, what John has given is a prophecy, is a word, is a, is a prophetic word. As a matter of fact, it's called, it's, it's called that five times in this book. Uh, in other words, let me just say this to you. It's not a fantasy. It's not poetry. It, it's not just something that off of somebody's head. What, what you're going to read here is a prophecy is a prophecy. And there's going to be detailed prophecies that are going to be revealed in this. Some of those, let me just list a couple of them. There's going to be the seven-year tribulation period. There's going to be the final war in the Middle East. There's going to be the arrival of the Antichrist. It's the second coming of Christ, the millennial kingdom it's going to talk about. It's going to talk about the eternal state. It's going to talk about the thousand-year reign of Christ. So you're going to get a lot of prophecy in this book on in, of, of Revelation. So don't be afraid of prophecy. Actually, about 30% of the Bible is prophetic, very much so. And so what is it prophesying? What's it pointing to? Everything in the Bible always points to Jesus Christ. Everything from the very beginning to the very end. It's all a picture of Jesus. Every bit of it. I've told you this before, but it has to bear repeating here. The Bible is the menu but Jesus is the meal. Jesus is the topic of all of it. It's a picture of Jesus and his kingdom. And, and it's going to use a lot of illustrations. It's going to be using a lot of num numbers and symbols, things like that. Uh, this book is very heavy on the number seven. Uh, as a matter of fact, 54 times, I believe, uh, there is the number seven something. Okay, And uh, he's going to be talking about churches. He's going to talk about seals. Uh, stars, you know, seven stars, seven thunders, seven, seven churches. And, and so it's very prophetic, and it's going to have something that's very relevant for that day and for this day. Uh, this book predicts the future, and this book promises blessing. Now, I'll show you that in a few moments. It's very important that you get that. But most of all, and, and please hear this, most of all, it is portraying a person. Many times we're so caught up in the beast and the Antichrist and all this other stuff. And I'm thinking, where's Jesus in all of this? I mean, all of this prophecy and all the things and the explanation concerning the book of Revelation, I don't hear anybody talking about Jesus. Jesus is the central figure. Revelation is portraying a person and some things that's going to happen in and through him. Now, let me just quickly lay out the chapters for you so you can see, because I want you to see that Christ is in every one of these chapters. In chapter one through three, we're going to see Christ holding the lampstand as, as the, and he is a kingly priest. Chapters four and five, Jesus is in heaven as the glorified lamb of God, the lion of the tribe of Judah. In chapter six through 18, Jesus is seen as the judge of all the earth. Chapter 19, Jesus is coming back as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. In chapter 20, Jesus is reigning on the earth as the bridegroom with his bride, the church. Chapters 21 and 22 describes Jesus as illuminating heaven with his glory. So uh, you're, you're going to find Jesus all through this thing. This is, this is a picture. It is a revelation of Jesus Christ. 
Now, to, to some people, they lose sight of that. I, to, to some people, Jesus is in a manger. To others, he's on a cross. But the bigger picture of him is that he is the one who was, he is the one who is, and he is the one that is to come. Wow. Incredible. And it's so important that we get a vision of Jesus before we get into the rest of this book, Revelation. So here's where we're beginning. Chapter 1. What's the very first five words that's in chapter 1 of Revelation? Well, it tells you what the theme is. Are you ready for it? The revelation of Jesus Christ. <laughs> I told you. I told you. You're going to get to where you start to listen to me. Isn't that the truth? That's what it is. It starts off. It tells you. I mean, it starts at the very beginning. The first five words is telling you this is what the book is about. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. So let's read verse one. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made known, signified it by sending his angel to his servant, John. Now, let me break that down real quickly. When he said this, the revelation of Jesus Christ, go back here, verse one, which God showed him, uh, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon or shortly take place. Now, that doesn't mean it was just going to take place then because a lot of people would say, well, they said shortly, but now that's been a couple of thousand years. So what's that mean? Well, you have to understand that he's not talking about that the context is not shortly as if, it's going to take place in a few minutes. What that shortly means is once it takes place, it's going to take place in a short amount of time. It's going to be like dominoes, that once you trip the first one, that all of the events are going to begin to fall into rapid succession. Okay? So when he said that there, he said this thing must shortly take place, and he said he made it known, he signified it. Now, I want to tell you what that word signified means. That, that word signified is where we get the word sign. It's a, it's a sign that shows us what is coming or what is there. That's where we get that word sign. And so it says that what he's done is, is he's taken this thing that he's given to John and he's, he's put it in the form of signs. He signified it. He put it in the forms of signs, of pictures, of symbols. And we can see that through the lampstands, the bowls, the beast, the, you know, etc. Uh, and and so he he's made this. He's he came to John. He gave him this prophetic word, and he gave it to him in signs. <clears throat> and it said he sent, and he said by sending his angel to his servant John. Uh, there's been a lot of questions what that meant, and I know some people say I know, and others says well I know. Uh, you know. Uh, it, it almost sounds as though there is a personal angel that is assigned to this <clears throat> that, that by, by saying that. Now, some say his angel uh, was Jesus. I've heard that before. Some say his angel was a, a, a personal uh, uh, angel that was assigned specifically to this thing. Another one said an angel was this or that. Uh, you know, kind of like Luke chapter 11 <clears throat> excuse me, uh, there was an angel that came on assignment that made himself his identity known as Gabriel. You're, you're going to find where angels are used in many different ways, but an angel nonetheless was used in this particular thing. Now, verse 2 said, who testifies to everything that he saw. Now, it didn't say that he he explained everything he saw. It said he testified to everything that he saw, that is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to read verse 3. It says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and who take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. So notice here in verse 3, this book promises blessing. I didn't see that before. Anything we'd ever heard about Revelation was, Dear God, I'm afraid of it. Well, it's because, I, I think because the reason is, is because the amount of people that were teaching the thing never saw Jesus. All they saw was the, the Antichrist. They never saw Jesus. All they saw was the beast. They never saw Jesus. All they saw was this problem and that problem. Some people are like that in life too. But he says here, this book promises blessings to those who read it, hear it, and do it. 
And to avoid this book is to rob yourself of a blessing. I mean, good gracious, because the secret, the secret of, uh, is living in the light of eternity. So this is giving us a glimpse into the light of eternity. Blessed is everyone who reads the words of this prophecy. It's a prophecy, something that is going to happen. It's a prophecy, okay? So he comes in here, and then in verse 7, or I'm sorry, verse 4, let's read this. He said, I, John, to the seven churches in the providence of Asia, grace and peace to you from him. I love this. Who was, who, who is, who was, and who is to come. And from, and from the seven spirits before the throne. The seven spirits before the throne. He said, and, verse 5, from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. I'm just telling you, <laughs> I'm just telling you right now, <laughs> there ain't nobody like Jesus. <laughs> Don't you, I, I, and I know, I just got to pause here for a second. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm starstruck. I, I, I am so, I'm so impressed by him. I'm so proud of him. I'm so, I'm so moved. <laughs> I'm so amazed. My heart gets overwhelmed when I look at the beauty of Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh, <laughs> he's, he's amazing. He's amazing. He's the faithful witness. He's the firstborn from the dead. He's the ruler of the kings of the earth. <laughs> oh, he's the baddest dude on the block and he carries a big stick. Let me just tell you something. Jesus is Lord of all. Let there be no misunderstanding. <laughs> and I love this. It said to him who loved us, he freed us from our sins and he washed us from our sins in his own blood. Jesus did that for me. <laughs> I, he did that for me. I, 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 and, and again, please forgive me for stalling here for just a second. I'm, I'm not a sinner saved by grace. I was a sinner and I was saved by grace. But when I came to Christ, he loved me. <laughs> he loved me. And he washed me in his own blood and clothed me in the garment of his righteousness. And I love Colossians 1.22 says, Through death he presented you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. <laughs> it's hard to even say that. I'm unreprovable in his sight. <laughs> he loves me. He loves me. Now somebody say, well, I'm, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. My righteousness is filthy grace. You're right. Your righteousness or your attempt to get like God or to be like God without him is filthy rags. But see, I'm not coming on the basis of my best effort. <laughs> I laid all of that at the feet of my Savior, and he loved me, and he took me from that horrible, dreaded place that I was in and where I was going, and he loved me, and he held me to his bosom, and he recreated me, he washed me, he purged me, he gave me a new name, a new identity, and now I stand before God righteous. I'm in right standing with God, justified, just as if I never sinned, as though sin never existed. That's how I stand. And when I stand before God, I don't stand before God with dread or with fear. I stand in the rights of Jesus Christ himself. In other words, I have as much right to be in the presence of God as Jesus himself does because I'm not there based on anything that I ever have done or ever could do, but because I trusted in Christ. My hope is in Christ. My, 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 my endurance, my ability 
to stand is in Christ and Christ alone. There ain't nothing like him. I'm just telling you. And he presented me holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. And that, my friend, is powerful. And so that's what he did. He said, there, verse 5, he took us and he loved us and he washed us in his own blood. And, and uh, he eradicated the note that was against us, nailing it to his cross. He, he erased the note. You know what that means? You know what that means? <laughs> and, and again, please forgive me. Well, I don't care. I'm stalled out here, but then I'm staying here for a second. What that means is he erased the note that was written against me. Now, when you go in debt someplace for some company, they have record that you owed them money. Even if you paid it off, they still have record. They have that on their files, on their downloads. But Jesus went in and erased the note that was against you. <laughs> Do you hear me? You know what that means? <laughs> they can't prove you were ever a sinner. <laughs> they can't prove that ever happened. There's no proof. So, so, so the enemy comes up to you and says, you're just an old sinner. You say, prove it. I mean, what's he going to prove? Where is he going to get the documentation that ever proved it? Because Jesus eradicated the note that was against you, taking it out of the way. He took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. That's how thorough the purchase was in your behalf. And that's how thorough the standing is and the foundation that you have in Jesus Christ. Dear Lord, and then, well, let me just go ahead and finish reading this. And in verse six, it says, and he made us to be a kingdom of priests, kings and priests. Now, the, the NIV says he made us to be a kingdom. Now, at first, because I'm always reading that from the King James, he's made us to be kings and priests. But when I look at that, that's just another little dimension for you just kind of mull over a little bit. He made us to be a kingdom. We're not just somebody that's in this thing. We are this thing. We are the temple of the Holy Ghost. He made us to be a kingdom and priest. That's who I am. We're kings, we're priests to serve God and the Father. And then he said, to him be glory and power forever and ever ever. Amen. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Dear Lord, Oh, there ain't nobody like Jesus. There ain't nobody like him. <laughs> he is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He's the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. Dear God, I love him. <laughs> oh, my goodness. If, if you don't know Jesus Christ on a personal level, I don't even know what to tell you. <laughs> oh, my God. How... How, how can you not know him and want him and desire him? I, I, don't, even, I don't understand that. I don't understand that. All right, well, I've, I got to finish. We're just, that's just verse six. I'm out of my mind here in verse six. <laughs> oh. <laughs> wow. Wow, 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 wow. Well, verse 7 said, look, <laughs> he's coming with the clouds. <laughs> oh, my word. I need help here. <laughs> he, said, he said, look, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those that pierced him. And all the peoples of the earth are going to mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. Let me just say something. All the scoffers, all those that thought it was this or that, yeah, you know, I'm just, it's all right. It's all right. He's coming. He's coming. I don't care if somebody says, I don't believe it. I don't, I don't give a flip whether you believe it or not. He's coming. He's coming. And every eye is going to see him. 
and every tongue is going to confess that he is the Lord. And then he said in verse 8, he made this statement. He said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and I am the end, says the Lord God, who was and who is, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Wow. I, I, I'm going to just read that again. That was so much fun. I just got to read that one more time. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I, I was in church on Sunday morning. And I saw something that I don't hardly even know how to... Um, articulate um i i was um i was in our worship service they sang the first song and man i'll tell you something right now we are rocking with some worship and intense presence of god and in, in our services it's just intense manifest presence of god but I saw something. As we went into the second one, second song, I, I had a, and please forgive me here because I, I'm literally, I'm, I'm stumbling I, uh, for the words to even articulate what I saw. But I saw something. It was like God opened my eyes and for a moment, for a second, I saw the sovereignty of God. Now, uh, I'm not just talking about the bubble that I live in, that I know God cares for me and this is my relationship with him and this is who he is to me. He's my, he is my lawyer, he's my doctor, he's my friend, he's my savior. It was beyond that. Uh, it, it was more than just God cares for me. But the only thing I can say is I saw a big picture and maybe for the first time, I saw a big picture as though I was looking at a glimpse of all of the galaxies and all of the universes and all of the things that God was and did. And for, for just a, a second, I had a glimpse of who he was. And it was something so big that I just stopped. I... I I just, I just stopped. I, I, I didn't know what to say. I, I, I couldn't say. I could. I just stood there, and it was a sense of. And please forgive me. I'm, I'm, I'm reaching for the words to know how to say it. It was a sense of awe and fear. Now, not fear in the sense that I was afraid of him, but it was something so big that you step back fearful and startled it was like i was it it kind of takes your breath away you're startled because i saw a big picture and i'm sorry everything that i'm saying just just does not say what i saw but it just stopped everything for for just a moment i i he let me have that glimpse i I saw, I saw how how big he was, how I, I, how magnificent he was. I, I I saw I saw his, his somehow his sovereignty. I saw I don't even know how to explain it, but I saw it. <laughs> and I am just telling you right now. <laughs> he's amazing. Who God is? It's 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 not. It's not, we've just got everything whittled down into this little box that we can frame everything around. But this, who he is, is so much bigger than our ability to, to, to even comprehend it, much less describe it. It's kind of like Paul, when he's caught up in the third heaven, he said, I, I saw things which are not lawful for me to, to speak. I, I don't know that it wasn't lawful for him as against the law from doing it. I just think he didn't have the words, the vocabulary. It was something that was so magnificent that he literally didn't have the vocabulary to say what he saw. And I'm telling you something. He is all of that and more. 
He is all of that and so, so, so much more. He is the Alpha. He is the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He is the Lord God who, who is and who was and who is to come. And what this verse says there in verse 8, the Almighty. And, and, and we, like I said, we wash that down to try to fit our brain around it. And we always make that smaller. But any thought that you have of God is smaller than what he is. And that was an experience that I, I will never forget. I, I will never, ever forget. I, 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 like I said, I was... I, I, I just, I stepped back and it was like it took my breath. It was, I was fearful. I was startled. I, I didn't know how to respond. He's, he, he's that big. He's that, he, he's that big. <laughs> and, and I want you to see that. Please forgive my bumbling over this. I, I, I'm trying, I'm trying. But he said it here in verse 8, I am Alpha and Omega. <laughs> I am the Lord. He's, he said, I am who was, who is, and who is to come. He said, I am the Almighty. My God, the earth must have shook when he said that. <laughs> oh, whew, dear Lord. Well, that's the, that's the deal with John. And now... He's going to start in verse 9, just going to kind of tell what happened. This is what he saw. And, and let, me, let me just kind of scroll through this if I can. He said, I, John, your brother, verse 9, and your companion in the sufferings of the kingdom and patient endurance that is ours in Jesus, I was on the Isle of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. He said, on the Lord's day, and on the Lord's day, I was in the spirit. He said, I heard behind me a loud voice, like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see. Just send what you see. And he said, I want you to send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, Thyatira, to Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. <laughs> what what must that have been like? I mean, John's in his nineties right now. It's it's been six decades since he's seen Jesus in the flesh. <laughs> Think about that. It's been at least six decades since he's seen Jesus in the flesh. And he said, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And he said, when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Now we're going to look at a description of Jesus here. And he said, among the lampstands, there were seven lampstands, and among them, was someone like the Son of Man. My God. <laughs> Among the lampstands, was someone like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet 
with a golden sash around his chest. <laughs> his hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow. It's very similar to Daniel's description of the Ancient of Days. He said his eyes were like a blazing fire. He had this penetrating gaze. Can I just tell you something? He sees everything in you. He sees everything in me. Verse 15 said his feet were like bronze, glowing in a furnace, symbols of judgment, strength. And his voice was like the sound of rushing waters, of many waters. He said in his right hand, which is a place of honor, he held seven stars. Now that's most likely the leaders of that church. That's probably who it was. There's different views on that, but I will say one thing. The leadership of the church, I've learned this through many years of pastoring, is he keeps me. He keeps me in his hand. He keeps me in that place of honor. And if the Lord had not kept me, I would not be kept. That's the truth. Well, in his right hand, he held these seven stars. And coming out of his mouth <laughs> was a sharp double-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in its strength, like the sun shining in all of its brilliance. Oh my God. That's the glory. It's the glory of God. Do you know, do you know that, that uh, probably the most uh, predominant description of God is light? Uh, glory manifest in light, fire, something like that. You see that uh, with Moses when the bush was burning, but it wasn't consumed. That was actually the, the glory of God. The fire fell on them uh, on the day of Pentecost. Ezekiel said God was clothed from his loins up, and his loins down with fire. Well, it wasn't fire. That was the glory. He's clothed in the glory of God. And that's actually the way Adam and Eve was. They were created in God's image. They were clothed with the same thing God was. They were clothed with the glory of God. When they sinned and fell and was born again, suddenly that glory left them and they were left naked. It wasn't as though they suddenly were naked and didn't realize that. I mean, it could be a break. Adam was brilliant. He named all of the animals. The capacity of Adam was incredible. Of course they knew if they would be naked. But the fact is they weren't naked as such. They were clothed with the glory of God. And, and so there he said, when you see Jesus here, he said, it's like his face was like the sun shining in its brilliance. <laughs> wow. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. You know, and, and this is the only description in the entire Bible of what Jesus looked like. Did you know that? It's the only one. Wow. Well, he said in verse 17, I saw him and I fell at his feet as dead. <laughs> now see, but this had happened 60 years earlier with, with, with Peter and James when they were at the Mount of Transfiguration. You remember that, the Mount of Transfiguration? They saw Jesus and they fell on their face. That happened then. Well, it's now happening to him all over again. And then he said in verse 18, he said, this is what Jesus said, I am he who lives, the living one. I was dead and now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys to death and to Hades. That is a declaration of absolute dominance. As far as you can say, that is a declaration of dominance. Make no mistake about it. 
He is the dominant one. Make no mistake about it. Jesus is the Lord. Make no mistake about it. He is the, he, he is the living one. He's the one that was dead and is now alive, and he's alive forevermore, and he holds the keys to hell and of death. That's who he is. Wow. And verse 19 he, he is, is the outline of how this book is going to be laid out, okay? So verse 19, I want you to look at this. He said, I want you to write, therefore, what you have seen, that's chapter 1, what is now, which is going to be chapter 2 and 3, and then after that, I want you to write what's going to take place later. Okay, does that make sense? So what he's going to do is he's going to begin to give him a lot of information here. And he's going to throw symbols at him. I want to just reiterate this one more time concerning symbols. He signified it. And and, and he used symbols. Uh, and, and here's the reason why. There's about... Four reasons that we might look at. Uh, one reason why he used symbols. Why, why does this look like it does? Well, it is a very important prophecy that was given on the Isle of Patmos and has held enduring for all of these years. And it's still relevant. And there's a couple of reasons. One, he did this for preservation. Uh, symbols uh, like what he had, uh, they can transcend time. And they're not weakened by time. They're not weakened by language. They're not weakened by culture. They're still the symbols. So he wanted to preserve that. Another one would be emotion. That would be another reason why he used symbols. Uh, symbols arouse strong emotions. Uh, you know, he starts talking about, I saw the beast coming out of the sea. Well, that's that's pretty powerful to, to the believer. You got to understand that. Well, number three would be is the fact of orientation. Now, Hear me on this, because out of the 404 verses that compromise the book of Revelation, almost 300 of them harken back to the Old Testament references. So most of these symbols are rooted in the Old Testament. Now, it might be strange to us in some ways, but to a first century reader that was familiar with the uh, Jewish uh, apocalyptic literature like Daniel or like Ezekiel, it makes a lot more sense. And then number four would be protection. That's another reason he may have used it for that time, because the early church was under the watchful eye of Rome. And I'm just telling you something. They seized every document they could find for the purpose of trying to bring them to court for treason. They were killing them for any reason whatsoever. So you can see there that he wanted him to, he said, I want you to write. He said, write what you've seen, write what's now, and write that which is to come. And so now he goes into verse 20. He says, the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Now, isn't that really kind of cool? See, that's how he's going to finish it. But one quick note here. The churches are represented by a lampstand. That, and, and that really cool. How fitting is that? Um, a lampstand raises the oil lamp so high that it gives light. And isn't that exactly what our commission is? Isn't that what Jesus said? He said, you're the light of the world. Have you ever thought about yourself in that way? I'm the light of the world. I'm being lifted up. Our church is being lifted up. I, me as a believer, I'm being lifted up that I might be light in the midst of darkness. Because that's what God does. God uses light in the midst of darkness. Darkness cries out for help. God sends light. That's that, and that is also is a reason probably for many of your assignments and the things that you've gone through. That might tell you where you are right now is because you're on assignment. Light is gone into darkness. Darkness cried for help, and God sent you. How wonderful is that? How wonderful is that? Well, okay, that's chapter one. I I hope you've I, I hope you've gotten something out of this. Uh, just remember, this is about Jesus. <laughs> it's all about him. It's all about him. And, and, and we're going to talk about him a whole lot through this book. So leave a note. I would certainly appreciate it if you could leave a note. You can also share this with somebody. Just push share. You can send it to your friends or put it on your, on your, uh, on your feed, and it will go to all of your friends. If you want more information, you can go to my website at jerryedmond.com. And I'll be, there's a lot of things, a lot of resources there that'll just be a blessing to you. But I love you guys. Thank you for, thank you for being with me. 
Thank you for your thank you for your friendship. Thank you for being my friend. I love you guys. I really do. I love you guys. And I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next chapter. Bye-bye.